Welcome to the Swim Swim Breakdown. As always, I'm your host, Coleman Hodges, coming to you from Austin, Texas. We are joined by Swim Swim Editor-in-Chief Braden Keith from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Senior International Reporter Loretta Race from Kentucky. What's up, y'all? Loretta, I like your cat paintings. Are those new? They are new, and they are, I'm told, lit. <laughs> <laughs> they are so lit. They are so litty. Lit. <laughs> litty kitties. <laughs> That's going to be the name of our new spin off podcast where we talk about everything <laughs> but swimming. <laughs> the swim, swim Swam presents Litty Kitty, the not swimming <laughs> podcast. <laughs> All right. Well, it was, it was, it's been a slower news week, but we still have a lot, surprisingly, a lot of topics to discuss. College swimming is now in full swing, highlighted last week by Leon Marchand's number 200 IM of all time, 4663. Uh, he, he threw down some good times in Tempe as they got their season kicked off at Arizona State. How much does 100 IM? tell you about things to come for the rest of the season we know the 100 im is not an ncaa event i know that's what i was gonna say (laughs) fast swimming is fast swimming to me uh and this was stupid fast uh it sure did mean a lot when uh, shane casas went 46-3 or whatever it was that worked out pretty well for him he finished the year with i think three ncaa titles he did that he did that his junior year right um Mm -hmm. So mm-hmm. I, you know, I think it means he's fast. He's ready to go. He, he told us um, that he was taking a little break after worlds, which is why he didn't go to euros, but that doesn't seem to have hindered the start of his new season um, much at all. You know, the, the new faces training in Tempe don't seem to have int- intimidated him. It seems like all of the things that possibly could have derailed Leon Marchand's march to the top of the swimming world have not happened. Um, and that's what it tells me. So I would look for multiple records to go down this year. Hmm. But it's also after he did a hundred of each stroke, right? So it's not like he just dove in and this was like his one event that he swam during that particular day. So I think that's ultra impressive that it was also after, you know, it was at the end of whatever it was an hour, hour and a half long stint of swimming. Um, but it also just says the talent that is Marshawn because he's, near a world record in the 400 long course I am. And then he spits out the number two hundred I am in yard. So it's like the full spectrum of swimming. And so for me, it tells me more about just him and his talent, just rather than what this particular event predicts. As good as Hugo was in that 400 I am last year, that record still feels a little bit soft to me. It feels like Mm -hmm. Leon is going to come in and just annihilate it this year. (laughs) Especially (laughs) after uh his, his 137 200 im right like no one expected that but that was like oh and then to to talk to bob bowman a few weeks or a month ago and have him be like yeah leon knows what he did wrong in that race so he'll, he'll be better this year <laughs> which is the most bob bowman thing to say ever about anything so yeah <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. multiple records, I could see it, uh, but it's it's pretty scary to see that speed that quick in the season. Um, on the other side of the country, we had Maggie McNeil throwing down two new LSU records in a 51-100 back and a 4700 freestyle in a freaking dual meet. It's, <laughs> it's just so yeah. crazy. The um, effect. When's that article dropping? <laughs> Seriously. So I want you guys to look into your crystal balls and tell me in the hundred fly at NCAAs, uh, can Maggie regain her throne with Kate Douglas, Claire Curzan, Tori Husk, and anyone else who will be crazy enough to swim that event, uh, chasing Maggie for that crown. I'm going to hedge a little bit because I think one of two things is going to happen at Stanford. It's either Tori and Claire are going to push each other to their limits every day, and it's going to be a wonderful training relationship, and they're both going to go like 48 fives, or it's going to be too small of a pond for that many big fish. Um, 
and it's going to crash and burn and they're both going to go 49 mids. I wish I could crash and burn and go 49 mids. <laughs> um, you just crash and burn. You know? <laughs> so, uh, that's why we're on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, you know, that's it, God. And then you talk about Kate Douglas, like college swimming's um, hottest swimmer, the most momentum of anybody in the country. We forget about just how, you know, video game good she was last year. It's, that's going to be a great race. I, if I had to put a significant amount of money on it, I would probably take the field against Maggie, but I think it's going to take 48 to be top three. I really do think that three will get into the 48s this year. Ooh. Cause the American record is, it's 49. Oh, right. Right. Still, Kate got Kate the Douglas. American record. Yeah. yeah. So, so you're talking American record, if it's an American that swims it, is going to have to get 48 high, you're saying? Yeah. I mean, Maggie's, <laughs> Maggie's NCAA record is 48.8. Well, do we know what else she might swim, though? I mean, that also comes in. I mean, they're all going to be swimming multiple events. Yeah. You I know, wonder and if Needle dropped the 100 fly. I wonder. I bet she Because that comes into play, obviously. You know, yeah. you want to say, yeah, they're all going to go 48H, but this is, I don't know, when's 100 fly in NCAAs? I don't know. What day does it fall in and what have they already swum? And... Three. Okay. Yeah. But that, you're with Kate especially, you're kind of also thinking, like, what does Virginia need her to swim? Mm-hmm. I know Todd is big on, like, what excites you, but it's like, if she's their only scorer in the 100 fly... Yeah, but do we think, I mean, do we really think it's going to be that close to where that two or three point swing is is how they're going to make that decision? Um, Stanford, <laughs> Stanford. It's uh, too early, right? Stanford, too early. With, <laughs> Stanford with Reagan, maybe, but Stanford without Reagan yeah. to me. I, it's, they, it's, they'd it's have to the really level of possibility. up. I just they'd have to really level up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Loretta, Maggie or the field. (sighs) Oh my gosh. Okay. To me, that's such an, I mean, to me, it's so obvious that you take the field, right? Why though? I mean, because the other three are also so good. But then why would you put the balance in their favor? I mean, because it's three versus one. (laughs) (laughs) It's Maggie, right? We're saying, okay, we're saying she's going to break like eight LSU records or whatever you said it. The previous podcast, and she's yeah. you know pull them okay, into so like a top a eight finish at CC. Here's the thought: Maggie might not have relays to swim. Mm. You know, she might be the Brooks Curry of LSU 2023, where she doesn't have relays to deal with, and she's much fresher than everybody else. Gets to start her meet a day later. Will be her second swim of the day instead of her whatever third. So in that case, point. I'm taking Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a good point. Good. Yeah, it's just like the field, you have three women who are all kind of in the last year, their stars are rising, right? And in the last year was the worst year of Maggie's career in the last three years, mm-hmm. right? I think that's fair to say. Uh because she had been like going up and up and up, and then she finally came down a little. And I don't think it's out of the realm of possibilities at all for her to come back up but the momentum is not currently in her favor (sighs) michigan was a mess last year and i think i think we have to acknowledge that it seemed like it we don't know why but yeah things did not seem good (laughs) um god when you look through this field emma sticklin is who is rising 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 at texas kylie Mm -hmm. aylin's on the fifth year from NC State, Gabby Albiero go, going into her junior year, Olivia Bray, part of that Texas group, Ellen Walsh, if she comes back. Like, this is a stupid oh, field. Yeah, we don't know what she's doing yet, right? Somebody, somebody that like has Olympic final potential will wind up in the B final. That's scary. That's, That's how wow. good this field is going to be if everybody swims it. Maybe, maybe right. Stanford moves Claire to the 100, just the 100 back and doesn't have her swim the 100 fly. I feel like Stanford and you know, you know, Virginia, like swim what you feel. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like sometimes Stanford takes the polar opposite approach where they almost make event choices based on like comfort, not excitement. Mm. And I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say. 
<laughs> I feel like if I was if if I was Stanford, I would put Claire in hundred fly and hundred back. Yeah. Would you drop Tori from hundred fly? Ever do fifty free two IM double? No. <laughs> no, no, no. That seems like a terrible double. Yeah, probably. Uh, yeah, no. I'd have her. I might have her do four hundred IM. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Even though she so could podcast throwback. <laughs> yeah. All right. Moving on from college swimming. Uh well, kind of. Our very own David Clossy came up with his own decathlon after seeing the Texas men swim their little 50s one. He took it a step <laughs> up. He said the real swimming decathlon should be four fifties of each stroke. Four 200s of each stroke, plus the 200 IM, plus the 1,000 freestyle, uh, which I think anyone would love seeing a college team do this as like an inner squad or anything like that. I'm curious, outside of like an inner squad format, do you think that this event would have legs for spectators? Do you think people would like watching this? Okay, so I've long thought that some kind of format like this would be entertaining. And ISL kind of goes halfway there, but they don't really make anybody do it. Um, I'm I'm a little surprised he didn't throw diving in there because I think that, that fits better with the the dick, with the true athletics. That would be a disaster. I think I someone know. in the comments threw diving in. I, <laughs> or no, oh, he did I, it at I, the I, end, I, right? He did at the end. Yeah. <laughs> I swam with a girl in high school who dove and swam at the D2 level. And she's, as far as we know, she's the only um, woman to qualify for the Texas high school state championship in both swimming and diving. Wow. So it can be wow. done. You know, athletes are athletes. <laughs> athletes going to athlete. Um, it is physically possible. Yeah. I mean, the best, the best decathletes aren't long jumping 27 feet. So, you know, um, I think people would, I don't know if people would pay to watch it. I think people would watch it as a novelty. Like people enjoyed duel in the pool. I think people, this has like been a a recurring theme on this podcast. I feel like, um, will people watch novelty events? And the answer seems to be yes over and over again. I, again, paying for it and watching it for free are two different things, but people seem to be excited about these sorts of things. You'd have to, you know, if we really got into the weeds, we could have Barry on and, you'd have to be careful with how you mathed it because if you just add the times, the the distance freestylers would win everything. But that's, I I disagree because like, I feel like, okay, the, the, the idea is, is a novelty, but you're still talking about like 20 races basically to get to like the final score and the average like swim fan who's not, like who's more of a spectator than like an actual swimmer is not going to stay around to the end to be like, Oh, you know, they won 10 no, events. Right. And, no. Cause in track and field, I mean, honestly, people watch like the hundred and the 400 and people don't watch the pentathlon. I mean, honestly, people don't. So they're not going to stick around and be like, Oh, you know, we have another four fifties or another five, two hundreds or whatever. And you know this- what people would do? They would log on to swim slam, read about it and argue about it. But that's not the, that's not your, your would be mass swim fan. Those are Correct. swim nerds. Those are swim swim <laughs> yeah. junkies. Correct. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a decathlon is not going to, you're right. A decathlon is not going to make the sport a spectator sport. I right. think it could, it, I think it could engage the existing audience at a deeper level. It could, it could. Yeah. That's... But it's definitely not going to broaden it. <laughs> because, because so much of the swim audience is taking kids from practice having them come on swim slam and Twitter and Instagram and everywhere else, seeing what the pros do and then going back to practice and trying to replicate it. Like that is, mm-hmm. that is a huge chunk of the swim fan audience. Um, so, you know, I think, I think that provides some value from these kind of fluky novelty things. It, it gives coaches a way to engage their athletes differently. Yeah. A lot of teams went back and did pentathlons. Um, you Indy sent me one. They had a kid go go really fast in a pentathlon. I forget what he what his time was, but yeah. Uh, when I was just at Orange and White, Eddie said he a couple of Texas recruits like did it as well and sent him their scores, right? According to the Eddie Reese math or, or rating system. Um, so it's I mean, it seemed like it engaged people, and I think 
a pentathlon like this would engage the same sort of audience. That seems like a good consensus. I like, I like these pentathlons. Cal always kicks off their season with a competitive pentathlon. It's against Cal Poly. Mm -hmm. Um, I like it as a season kickoff because you're still at the point of the year where the coaches haven't fine tuned anything. It's all just kind of about effort and focus and whatever. And people puking. You're going to have people puking in buckets on the deck. I would I would pay money to see like a Cal versus Texas pentathlon. Yeah, that'd be um, great. In, just, 50, you know, in 50s and 200s. Oh, God. Yeah, that makes me just thinking about um, it. <laughs> but like the classic five, five 100s, a 100 of each stroke. I mean, uh, Cal versus Arizona State. That's a... That seems like a realistic pentathlon to set up geographically. Um, Arizona State went ham in their pentathlon last week, as we talked about earlier. Uh, Charlie Brown, can we can we talk briefly about Charlie Brown? Raise your hand if you knew the name Charlie Brown as a swimmer before last weekend. And she was there's faster. an English swimmer. There's an English swimmer named Charlie Brown who's a boy. So yes, I have heard of a Charlie. <laughs> okay, Brown. but you haven't heard about Arizona State's Charlie Brown. No, she, I have not. He was faster than Izzy Ivy in the pentathlon. I mean, that's a, that. It, had really? we uh, had we waited a few days, she would have been on our top five to watch. I think. Mm. Dang. That's too wild. Little, too late. Um, Cal also does a. Cal and Stanford have a triple distance meet every November where they do 50, 100, 200 of each stroke. And that then feels antiquated to me. 100, 200, 400. Do they do? And then they have like a distance thing. Yeah. And then like a, maybe they have an IM one, but I can't remember. Yeah, they do. Um, that feels antiquated to me because it's, that's not how swimmers swim anymore. Like the, the best hundred butterflyers are all hundred backstrokers. The best, very few of the, the top hundred butterflyers are 200 butterflyers. I don't know about very few, but like it's, that, that doesn't, I think that doesn't recognize the shift in uh, swimming that we've seen in the last decade. It's probably I, something that Skip Kennedy started in the seventies and <laughs> everybody was afraid to stop doing it. I do. I, I agree with that, but I do like it as a novelty meet format. Yeah. It's fun to watch the sprinters die, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that sort of thing. <laughs> and the 200ers try to sprint. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, moving. Mo now we're moving away from college swimming. WADA did nothing <laughs> about their uh, rules regarding marijuana and testing positive for it, getting bans for testing positive for it. Do you agree with this that WADA should should keep marijuana on the list of sub of banned substances? Agree is such a loaded word. Uh, you know, everybody on this podcast is an American, and I don't think we need to really explain to our audience the changing attitude in the United States since Michael Phelps's bong incident in 2008 on marijuana. Like that would not even register on anybody's radar uh, in 2022. So, you know, do I think there needs to be reform to these rules? Yes. I, I really liked what USADA President uh, Travis Tiger told us this week, which was basically as long as it's not done intentionally to gain an advantage and as long as it doesn't impact the safety of the competition, which is relevant in some sports, um, you don't want your cyclers out there smoking pot before they ride because uh, it impairs your reactions and that can create dangerous situations in some sports. So, you know, short of those two things, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be an issue. On the other hand, I understand that WADA is a global organization and in most of the world, it is still illegal. Uh, I think, I think until more of the world has legalized it and changed its general attitude, I understand why, you know, when you read the press release, WADA sort of feels like they're, they're pro banning marijuana, like the way they, what they've included in the press release and what they haven't included in the press release. They talk about that. They talk to experts, right. But they didn't tell us what the experts said. Um, and, and it just feels like their sort of personal opinions might be anti-marijuana, but I think until the world's attitude has shifted more, you 
they're they're in a tough place. You know, I I understand why they they have banned it. Um, I would like to see them raise the threshold again to where it's more akin to did you smoke pot in the car on the way over or did you smoke pot three days ago? Like, you know, what's what's the threshold where you're no longer high and and figure out what that threshold is and set the threshold there. Um, and again, you you have to do it sport by sport. Right. Cycling has to have a different a different rule than swimming does. Um but that's that's kind of my take on it. I am not a marijuana smoker. I am sort of pro legalization, but I am not a user myself. I think it smells terrible. <clears throat> but um, Watt is in a tough place. I I, I understand why they do the, what they do. Well, the what we had written that Watt had said is that it has the potential to enhance sports performance. So, you know, if if you're talking about raising the threshold or whatever, I mean, then it probably negates any sort of remote possible sports advantage, performance advantage. Um, but they did point to that. Okay, so that so, that. So can I tell you a funny story about this? Uh, <laughs> everybody in the comments, everybody's response to anybody being banned for marijuana is, oh. Mar- have you ever tried to play sports while high marijuana is not performance enhancing which first of all we have to be clear wada is correct that they do have a three-part sort of standard for what they ban and two of those parts are not performance related and all of the countries in the world have signed off on and agreed to that so let's make that clear but it's funny because when when this first the first time in swim swam history when this was an issue i reached out to some internationally renowned marijuana expert um and he was he was definitely an advocate but he was an expert and he was so eager to speak well of marijuana my question was pretty kind of simple it was do you believe that marijuana can be a performance enhancing for sport and he said absolutely i believe it can and it was because he was like so strongly in advocacy, you know, you're thinking this is 2012, 2013, where you, you're still fighting to convince people of, of that it's okay to smoke pot. Um, and he was just so gung ho about it that he just declaratively stated, yes, it can performance enhance, <laughs> not sort of not sort of piecing together that in the context of the story we were writing, that that was actually a bad look for marijuana or, or a, a strike mm-hmm. against marijuana. Right. It was not moving marijuana forward. <laughs> right. And so ever since everybody's been trying to argue that it's not a performance enhancer, but you know, that this is how conversations around marijuana go, right? Like they're right, very right. advocacy driven. There's yeah. not a lot of s- pure science driven conversation it's it's very you it's it's become like everything else right it's so polarized people just like will will only take the stand on the side that they're willing to take a stand on um so well the other the the other you said it was like the tripod or whatever of like the of what gets something banned and the other one was that i don't i forget what the second one or, or the third but one of them is that it violates the spirit of the sport and i just think that's i know <laughs> i was like could you be any more ambiguous like that's just their yeah. catch-all category you know to be able to throw anything that they don't want yeah. Yeah. that just says that the wada executive committee can break any ties right yes yes but i would i would assume a lot of people would kind of bond over. what about like what about like surfing are we saying marijuana <laughs> is not within the spirit of the sport and surfing <laughs> exactly. or, skating or break dancing <laughs> i refuse to believe that that's true exactly so so. my question is that how do you tell if marijuana was used for enhancement reasons versus recreational reasons like well, how if you tested positive for marijuana how could you tell that someone was trying to intentionally use it to enhance their performance. Remember that that the positive test is not the only way that WADA can ban things. Lance Armstrong or ban people. Lance Armstrong never tested positive, but he is banned. So they, you know, if they find if you test positive and and they find communications between you and somebody else saying, "Hey, I'm going to use this uh, for performance enhancement." I think that's probably pretty rare um, for that to happen. But, you know, 
I, they, they have other ways to do it. Um, it's a, again, it's, it's like a lot of this, the, the press release, it's just kind of nonsense. Um, you know, I, I think in swimming we're I think there's currently two big problems. And one is that they can strip results if you test positive, positive for marijuana. So like Shikari Richardson, she was eligible. Her suspension was over by the time the Olympics came. But because her result from the U.S. Olympic trials didn't count, uh, she didn't qualify for the team. So on a national level, you could actually skirt around this. It's, it's a little harder in the United States because of the way the laws are written here about sports. But you could skirt around this and basically give your uh, national governing body the ability to hold a time trial for anybody who gets one of these marijuana suspensions and is stripped of their results. You can offer them like a time trial to re-earn their spot on the team. Um or, or have some basically something beyond results, some other way to select them to the team, which, again, is hard in the United States. But we see, for example, British swimming does that. They, they leave room to just choose people to the team that they believe should be on the team. Um, so that's kind of a, a hack. We're a little sensitive to this in swimming because a marijuana suspension can get you disqualified from the ISL. You know, most of the marijuana suspensions these days are a month long, which in the scheme of professional sports is not a huge deal, but it depends on when that month is, but that can still disqualify you from the ISL. I would bet that the ISL with their new partners and new managers and all that stuff will review that policy a little bit, Um, but that's kind of a wrinkle for swimming, I think. But then that kind of opens, I mean, this is a whole other topic, but that kind of opens the doors, I would assume, for other people who had tested positive. Or I, did we ever decide if whereabouts violations like negate you from beating the ISL? You know what I mean? Yeah. But then there's going to be all these people that are going to come up with specific scenarios that'll have to be dealt with, you know, just if, if you kind of make, yeah. make, you know, concessions for, for you know, marijuana use in particular. Right. Hmm. Those are good points, points we may never have to address again, (laughs) but hopefully we do. (laughs) You're usually the toxic positive one, right? And (laughs) well, you know, let's 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 be real about that one. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, when it comes to the ISL, they've yeah they've used that (laughs) Coleman's. Yeah. But uh, we can talk about the ISL's weird step cousin, the World Cup. (laughs) <laughs> which uh, is coming back, albeit in a shortened version. We got three stops starting next month in Berlin. Mm-hmm. We have a list of confirmed athletes, including Kyle Chalmers, Matthew Sates, Kylie Moss, Thomas Chacon, the Hanson sisters, Louise and Sophie, Siobhan Howie, Maddie Wilson, Chad LeClo, and Kira Toussaint. Who are you most excited to see at this World Cup series? Can we start a GoFundMe to um, pay Katie Ledecky to go to this World Cup and break all the <laughs> records? Please. That's what I would like to see. Um, I think I, I think the answer's got to be Thomas Chacon. Um, you know, he had his world record breakout last summer, and this will be sort of his follow on. Um, and I don't think I really need to explain it any more than that. I like Thomas Chacon. He's who I'm most excited about. A lot of these names we've seen at the World Cup before, so we kind of have expectations about what they're going to do. So I'm going with Siobhan Hawley. Um, I'm excited because the first competition after the Short Course World Championships in December was just this past August in Hong Kong when she did the Long Course Open Championships there. And she ripped a 400 free uh, uh, Hong Kong record, national record. Uh, what was she there? 408.6, 156, four. These are long course times, two free. And then she also did pretty, I think it was a 53 high and 100 free. But bottom line, it's going to be her first, you know, major meet basically since out t- outside of Hong Kong, that is since the world course um, short championships, sh- short course world championships in December. And she had the injury last year, pulled out of worlds. So I'm just excited to see her bounce back. And she's very competitive, very competitive in short course meters. She holds, what does she hold? One of the world records, she won her free world record. So mm-hmm. 
yeah. Yeah, without ISL, we don't get to see a lot of these people on displays. <clears throat> and Siobhan's one, certainly one who was just wrecking it in the ISL. So I'm excited to see her. I got to go with the classics. Braden mentioned we'd seen all these before. We have, but Kyle Chalmers set the 100 free world record last year in the World Cup. He really got into his wraith racing rhythm, which I'm excited to see if he can do that again, especially just over three stops, <clears throat> two of which are in North America, which hasn't happened in quite some time. Swim Swam will be at both of those stops. Excited awesome. for that. And then Matthew Sates. I mean, come on. He's a pro now. As the commenters like to say, he is speed running a swimming career. He's already done pretty much everything you can do at a World Cup, but... South Africans have a rich tradition of dominating at World Clubs Cups. Uh, Chad Leclo, Cameron Vanderberg. <laughs> what? I was just jinx. Owe me a coke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, but don't you feel like awesome. what once bitten, twice shy with Matt Sates? He was great at the World Cup. He was great at NCAA's. His summer was not great. Like I'm, I'm ready to see Matt Sates in long course do what he seems like he should be able to do. I'm, I'm well, not that excited to see him just wreck the World Cup again. I'm ready for that too, but obviously he's really good at short course swimming. Uh, with the World Cup success, with the NCAA success, so like if and he's still very young, so like if he's still improving. If he goes best times, he's getting close to world records in some of those events. And I'm and always think, pro world records. And I think it means a little bit more because the short course world championships are in December. So I think, you know, they're only at that time going to be a couple months away. And for once, we're actually going to have an Australian team there because they're in Melbourne. So yeah. we'll actually get, you know, Chalmers will actually and kind of be YSL. looking to stake his claim. Yeah. Maybe yeah, Caleb yeah, yeah. Dressel's comeback meet maybe, based on Rowdy's maybe. timeline. No <laughs> absolutely I don't know. not but i don't know we talked about pressure this. low you know it's a good low pressure way to get back into it dude that that's like the the least caleb dressel thing caleb dressel do. or isl caleb dressel has done one? short course worlds hasn't he one time one? yeah okay in 2008 well, yeah, but he, he probably only wow. qualified twice what? I thought you did qualified by being on the long course national team. <laughs> I'm sure he did. Yeah, he was probably. on the Olympic team. <laughs> okay, but he was swimming for Greg Troy then. <laughs> Greg Troy doesn't believe in swimming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, I, I don't think we're going to see it in uh, in Melbourne. I don't think we're going to have a Dressel sighting there. Melbourne. But I Do can you hope. Know something we don't know? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I was informed today that I'm not going to that swim meet. So <laughs> that's, that's all I know for yeah. sure. That's because Fina doesn't let us do interviews. At Bummer. <laughs> Come on, Fina. Yeah, <clears throat> it's bad. And on that note, it's time to play our favorite game on the swim, swim breakdown, sink or swim. First up today on sink or swim, Sarah Showstrom said to someone that she wants to swim <laughs> at the 2028 Olympic Games. Sink or swim, that's going to happen. Swim. She's an Olympic superstar in a country without a lot of su summer Olympic superstars. So she'll continue to be paid as long as she needs to be paid by her sponsors to swim. And who's going to bump her off? Um, you remember that Swedish swimmers swim forever. God, say that 10 times fast. Swedish, <laughs> Swedish swimmers swim forever. <laughs> I, I, I cannot. Um, Teresa Alshimer <clears throat> was swimming until she was like 37 and then retired and then came back at 40 something. Um, so I, I think she absolutely will. I think like Teresa Alshimer, she'll probably settle into some kind of role where she does 50 free, 50 fly at the world championships, um, 50 free and relays at the Olympic games. You know, she's not going to have like a big schedule. I wouldn't think by that age, but Sweden's never going to be deep enough to keep Sarah Schoestrom off their Olympic team. Yeah. I think it's an easy swim. I think at the very least it'll be 50 free. That's what I pegged her for. So 
she, you can swim that forever, you know? <laughs> so. How old was Lars Frolander when he retired? Ooh. He yeah. Was, he, I mean, he swam at the Olympics at 38. Nice. Uh, That's yeah. That's not I, what I was doing at 38. <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing at 38, Loretta? <laughs> That's the next podcast. <laughs> we'll save that for Liddy days. <laughs> All right. uh, yeah, easy swim. I was going to bring up Therese. Braden stole it. Um, Swedish swimmers do this. They swim forever. They're to be fair. Those are all. Those are, those are all cryogenically oh. frozen naturally. It's a good point. Yeah, but Sarah Showstrom is a superstar. There's no reason why she would not be swimming there unless she didn't want to. And she said she did. So 50 free Los Angeles. Here we come <laughs> next up. Uh, Yuri Kissel, who someone in the comments thought may have retired, did not. He did switch training bases. He's now back home in Calgary. Uh, he was in Toronto before that. <clears throat> so with him not being retired, hopefully swimming until Paris. Do you sink or swim? The Canadian men will win a bronze, will win a medal in the <laughs> men's 400 free relay. Sink. I mean, who is there <clears throat> for Coleman? This is yeah. such a bad question. Seriously? Name there for Josh, Yuri, Javi, who split 47 this summer. And I know they have a fourth. They had a pretty solid foreigner free relay this summer. I heard a rumor that Javi was trying to train at, I think, Florida too. Which would is Javi like the G G A Z I E V? Who's Acevedo. that guy? Acevedo. Javier Acevedo. No, uh, it's and, and Ruslan. Ruslan. Yeah, Ruslan. Is their fourth. It's that guy. Ruslan. He, Ohio State. So he split. Yeah, he split forty-eight mid. At split forty-eight zero. Well, okay, sorry. He was 48 he was 48 mid from a flat start. So Okay, but look at the look at what medaled in Tokyo. No, no, no. That I'm not sink or swim, Braden. Sink. <laughs> um, I thought I made that in clear Tokyo? that I was <laughs> <You did. laughs> Matt, okay. the, the medal relay is 48 0, 47 5, 48 1, 46 4. Yes. Is mm -hmm. Josh Leando going to go 46-4? I have faith. Is And that, and that was with Hayden is, at 47-9. Is Yuri Kistel going to go 47-1 yeah. again at 29 years old? Yeah. Is it's two years go, later. Who's or the, I guess who's three years fourth? later. Is Marcus Thormeyer going to continue swimming after he finishes his PhD? He's not on it. Who's the fourth? It's Ruslan, Josh, Yuri, and Javi. What's Javi going to go? What's Javier's best time? He split 47 this summer. He split 47-9. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm still sinking it. I think, I think right. Italy has a young team with just as much potential. Um, I think you guys have made a better case than I thought you would. But I think... Uh, I'm sinking it too. No, I'm sinking it too. I was just helping you out with the guy I'd never heard of, the Ruslan guy. I, I had to look him up. I, I'd never heard of that guy. He was 48 mm -hmm. mid, plus start. So yeah. that's something. But yeah. I was sinking it because they're they were 0.6 away from the bronze, and they're not really going to get any better. And Australia is going to get better because now they have Flynn Southam, who's aging nicely in terms of the Paris Olympics, and. He's he's probably going to be at least forty seven high at the very least as a split, and they're not going to jump Italy, right? Exactly. The Americans Italy's in Italy are going to be right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's U.S., Italy, Australia, and then maybe Canada fourth, maybe not. I'm still hoping Japan right. eventually will live up to its sprint potential. <laughs> Keep dreaming. Ooh. I know. Ooh. I know. Four AM relay, two hundred breaststroke relay. <laughs> they are all over it. I yeah. know. Free relay. I don't know. That'd be rough. Uh, all right, I'm swimming it. I think Josh Lee knows the truth. I think he is wow. going to drag those three guys, uh, whoever those three end up being, <laughs> up with him. I think Ruslan's on the rise. I think Yuri can maintain. I'm not totally sold on Javi, but I think in the next two years, 
someone will be there. Uh, Kyle has been doing it for a long time. He's had a lot of surgeries. I don't think he's going to slow down, but for, does he have another 46, four in two years? That does know. mean you think he's going to slow down, right? By <laughs> <laughs> I know you don't want to say it out loud, Coleman, but it does sound like that's what you're saying. <laughs> Uh, I'm saying that uh, in that relay, he's, he's going to slow down. How old is he? 23? Yeah, he's not that old. Yeah. He's 20. He'll be 26. He was 18 in Rio. Yeah. And eight years later, he'd be 26. Math. <laughs> math, Coleman. That's why we keep you around. <laughs> All right. Next up, uh, Michael Phelps in an interview with NBC said that he thinks the 400 IM and the 200 free world records can be broken by Leon Marchand and David Popovich, respectively. Which one do you think will go down first? 4 IM or 200 free? I think both will go down. I think Leon is going to get the 400 IM first. Um, I, you know, I have a lot of like kind of mediocre reasons for why I feel this way. I think Bob Bowman has more experience sort of carrying a swimmer from a height to another height um, than than David's coach does. I think um, Leon Leon, uh, feels a little bit more like he's got this like palm energy to where he's just going to keep trudging forward. Leon has not like had his peak yet, right? David broke a world record this summer. And I think after breaking a world record, there can be a, a comeback to reality. And, you know, you can I you can almost run the risk of trying too hard to improve upon a world record. And I think that could that's going to be something they're going to have to learn, um, maybe look, make a mistake and learn from and then kind of do, do, do and go back to the top. Um, so I think I think. Leon is going to do it. I think he's going to have the support and momentum with uh, Paris 2024 coming ahead. I think he's closer to his prime. I can think of a lot of mediocre reasons that in totality, I am going to vote the Frenchman. I'm swimming it as well, but I, I, I'm clarifying it that I do agree that it's going to be the 400 AM first. I mean, Marchand's only mm-hmm. what half a second away from the world record when he was Swimming it, I like literally my jaw just was on the floor the entire time he was swimming that race. It, I couldn't believe he was getting that close to the record. And then also Popovich, the 200 free, he's like, what, 0.97, I think it is, away from Biederman's world record. So percentage-wise, Marshawn's closer. You know, there's a smaller percentage he has to kind of make to get the 400 IM world record. I also think it will be the 400 IM. Uh, that 200 free record has just been so oh. untouchable. As has the 400 IM, I guess, but people have kind of gotten close to it, and Leon got really close to it. Popovich broke some huge barriers this summer, but I think he's got a ways to go until that 200 free goes down. So, yeah, I'm going with Leon as well. Fina axed the 25K open water uh, from World Championships, which I saw that some people were upset about. I can't say I was one of those people. Uh, but you know, if people want to do it, then I don't know why stop it. Uh, do you, do you agree with this decision on Fina's part? Do you want to see the 25 K gone? Uh, can we rephrase that question? So I don't have to, (laughs) yes, I want to see the 25 K gone. I think open water needs to go back to having its own championship where they can do what they want they can have three different versions of the relay they can do all the distances they want they can do an open water 1k sprint um do it in the southern hemisphere in december and you know instead of this whole short course worlds mashup that we did last year which was silly um you know i I think there's a place in sport for people who have a desire to test their speed over a 25 kilometer swim, but it's not that it's pure sport, right? The 25 K has no spectator value, has no commercial value. I know why Fina did it. And if we're all going to sit here and scream into the wind about how we want the sport to be better commercialized, then we have to accept decisions like this. 
So continue to have a 25 K world championship, just do it on your own time, do your own <laughs> thing. You know? Just go I, out I, in the ocean and swim right. a 25 K yourself. Yeah. Well, a, a lot of people do, they do like the channel swims and all this. And I think that's kind of where Braden's going with it. I mean, I, I totally agree. And, and especially because we saw the, in our article, you know, the, the actual participants, at least for the women were going down. So it's not like, there's like 50,000 people who are wanting to swim this anyway. So in terms of the participants, it was actually low. It was like 15, I think was one year. And that's and for a world championships. That's not that many. So I, I'm was in the comments uh, swimming this topic to get rid of the 25 K. Oh, well, no. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm swimming. I think it, I think it was an okay decision by FINA and I don't think anyone should take it personally as a slam against open water swimmers. Well, and we it, saw at the European Championships that there can be challenges trying to get all three races in within the context of a championship. True. They right. ran out of time. Right. Um, that was ugly. We've we've been lucky at most of the major international meets that the weather has been decent enough. But um, yeah, that's a good consideration. Yeah. Yeah, it would be. It. I feel like they should. It should be treated as a different sport. Um, we just saw junior open water world championships go off in Seychelles, Africa. And that was cool. You know, it was like a three day event. Kids swam different events. We covered it pretty well. And like, it was fun to watch as you know, from home as just a, as a common but fan, you know, to watch, or was it fun because the winners were pool swimmers? Um, novelty for them back to our novelty <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Probably that. Yeah. However, if 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 there was an open water season, you know, if there was like a World Cup that led to this open water right. chance, I I know there's right. a World Cup, but it doesn't lead to the championships, right? It does. Its own separate it thing, does though. It. Like nobody does the open water World Cup, or very few swim. Very few of the elite swimmers do the whole thing. Yes. Okay. Well, then, yeah, get rid of it. Oh. Geez. Yeah. I don't know. It's one of those things where I am a firm believer that all sports need to exist in some form, but not every sport needs to be at the top of the pyramid. I tell people this in pickleball all the time. Everybody in pickleball wants pickleball at the Olympics. And I look at them and say, why? Like what? <laughs> what? Because then, you, you know, you think you get Olympic credibility by being an amateur pickleball player like you don't. Um I just, every sport does not need to be at the top of the pile. Although I think the 10 K is a nice addition to the Olympics. Um, but I don't know, not, not everything that can be done has to be done. It does, at the World yeah, that's a good way to put it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can, I, I agree with that one as well. Last up, uh, we saw we're ending with Canada's Josh Leando again. <laughs> he swam in 1960. He swam in 196 <laughs> and his first, he's the truth. That's my stance on it. 19650 free. First ever yard swim and a dual meet. Uh, we saw Mr. Jordan Crooks of Tennessee go 189-ish, more like 191 maybe, and a 50 free at the end of practice. To you, which one is a bigger deal? I I think Crooks is a bigger deal because that's a fast practice swim any time of year, especially this time of year. And as much hype as he got for his freshman season, I still don't think it was enough for where his ceiling seems to be. I, I hate to say this, but I thought Josh Lando was going to be faster. I know it's meet one. I know it's his first time racing in yards. I know it's Florida training where they, have their sprinters do 9,000 meters a day. But I just, I don't know. I thought, you know, I thought he was that kind of talent that could just pop off like a 19-3 just because. Um, so I was a little disappointed by that, but I think there's, I think there's plenty of explanations for why he was 19-6. They probably had him lifting in between races just to make <laughs> sure he didn't go too fast. Um, so I think Crooks is a bigger deal because that, you know, if anything else, that says that Leando, this is not Leando's race to lose necessarily. We talk about Brooks Curry because he won the 1500 free. 
Um, but Jordan Crooks is on a huge upswing. So to me, that's what makes it a bigger deal. Yeah, I'm going with Leyendo. I, I love it when international swimmers go to yards because I, it's like an experiment. You want to see exactly how it translates. And this is his first, not even test, just first swim. So I think I think 96 is totally great. I mean, if that's my baseline, I'm pretty happy with that at this point in the year. Totally. I mean, Brooks Curry in October last year was 19.5. Huh? 19.6 isn't what it used to be. Well, I'm not saying he's not going to stay there. It's just literally, okay, I just scratched the surface. Here's a little tip of the iceberg, and then he's going to just sledgehammer it. Josh Leendo wore a practice suit. Did Jordan Crooks? <laughs> sorry, that's what I mean. Jordan Crooks wore a practice oh. <laughs> um, Sorry, I'm watching Jordan Crooks' video. <clears throat> right now. Are you, you know, hand-timing it? Because you're just like gave him like a 210th leeway, 210, 310th leeway there. He has so much shoulder mobility. It looks like he's swimming backstroke. Oh, geez. Like, his straight arm freestyle is so over the top that it looks like he's swimming backstroke. That's wild. Um, Dang. Cool. Yeah, I'm going with Jordan Crooks as well. I think uh, 19.1 is legit. Nin- I think 19.6 is a really good time. It isn't what it used to be, but it's still for a dual meet. That's super fast. That's a great benchmark for Leendo. But going 19.1 in practice is like uh, I mean, if ni- superstar, if we, superstar if we, if we kind of swim. In a dual meet is good. How can 19.1 in practice not be better? Uh, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm giving, I'm, I'm just given the, the stopwatch leeway and then I'm just going with the international swimmer. <laughs> yeah, we know. I know. <laughs> Loretta hates America. I do not. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Jordan Crooks is also an international <laughs> yeah, swimmer. Yeah, that's, that's a very <laughs> is he? I don't know. Where's he from? I don't, I really don't know this kid. In islands. Inform me. Yeah. There we go. But his well, sister goes island. to high school in Alaska. So, okay. So, I think she did, but now she's in yeah. Florida. Okay. I'm with the bigger international country. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, that's our news for the week. Tune in every week to the Swim Swim Breakdown for your week's news and swimming.